to the All Canadian Reptile Girl. Uh, a little while ago, I made a video about some of my favorite common snake myths. You know the drill, you can watch that here if you haven't seen it already. While I only did eight in that video, it was by no means a comprehensive list. I know, it might shock you that there are more than eight myths about snakes. Crazy, right? So today we will be dispelling eight more snake myths. If you were hoping to see Hobbs with this one, as you did with the last one, I talked to him about it and he didn't want to. He said, nah, make Callie do it. So, here's Callie. She's still young, but she's still adorable. All right, I know that there are probably more than just eight more snake myths, but I'm kind of digging this top eight. Top three isn't long enough. Top 10 is way too long. Top four, lame. Someone else has already staked his claim to top fives. Sixes and sevens would just be a little bit confusing. A joke for my 4.5% of my viewers that are from the UK, but top eight, that could work. So without much further ado, here are my top eight snake myths, part two. Some of these are going to be ones that didn't make the cut from the last one, and some are gonna be suggestions from the comments in the last video. The first few are going to be relating to the adorable little noodles with venom, or death juice if you want to be scientific. Here goes. Baby venomous snakes are more venomous and or dangerous than the adults. This myth is very common. You see it online, in movies, I've actually seen it in outdoor survival guides. It goes like this. Baby snakes are more venomous than the adults because they either, depending on the interpretation, cannot control the amount of venom that they inject, or their venom is more concentrated. Either way, they are more deadly than their mom and pa. So obviously this isn't true. I wouldn't be talking about it if it was. Baby snake venom is not more concentrated than the adults. And even if they can't control the amount of venom that they inject in a bite, which they totally can, they have a lot less venom to give than a full grown snake. So even if they did dump everything in at one time, the adult would still have a lot more to give you. Here's the thing. The amount of venom in a snake bite is extremely variable. Some bites have lots of venom. Some have none. That's called a dry bite, by the way. So. Let's say that you were extremely unlucky and were bitten by both an adult and a baby rattlesnake. Could you get more venom from a baby? Sure, but you could just as easily get more venom from the adult. Basically, baby or adult, leave venomous snakes alone. That should be obvious though, right? Okay, next up, venomous snakes have slit pupils. Non-venomous snakes have round pupils. It's pretty straightforward. If you were going to Google right now, how to identify venomous snakes, the top result will probably show you a picture like this. So let's test this out. We can all agree that corn snakes aren't venomous. Let's look. Brown pupil, looking good so far. Okay, let's check a rattlesnake. Slip pupil. All right, maybe they're onto something and this myth is actually true. This might be embarrassing. Okay, boas are non-venomous. Let's look at Tituba. Gasp, that's a slip pupil. Maybe she's an anomaly. Let's check my two rolls boas. Hmm, Maclis python? Nope, those are slits too. Okay, maybe this is like uh, all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads kind of thing. You know, all venomous snakes have slit pupils, but not all slit pupiled snakes are venomous. Let's look at an iconic venomous snake, the cobra. Brown pupil. Coral snake? Hmm. Huh. Well, there you go. I think that the lesson here is, unless you know exactly what snake you are dealing with, leave snakes in the wild alone. Speaking of coral snakes, here's a handy rhyme to help you identify a venomous coral snake from a harmless milk snake that is doing a coral snake impression. That's called Batesian mimicry, where a harmless animal imitates a dangerous one. The rhyme will keep you safe by helpfully comparing adjacent colors on a snake. And it goes like this. Red on black, venom lack. Wait, or is it, we'll kill you, Jack. Wait, no, 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 it's black on yellow, kill a fellow. Or is it red on yellow, will kill a fellow. 
you see part of the problem. There's no consistent version. But even if there was, it wouldn't matter because there's no consistent version of coral snakes or milk snakes. Both snakes can exhibit variations in their pattern. Inconsistent rhyme, inconsistent snake pattern, very inconsiderate if you ask me. Again, unless you are 100% sure what kind of snake you are dealing with, leave it alone. The next myth is sort of related to the last. Colorful snakes are venomous, bland ones are not. Well, we just talked about a venomous snake and a similar looking non-venomous snake, so obviously this myth isn't true. But where this comes from is pretty cool. Bright or contrasting colors are often used as a warning. This is called aposematism. Wasps and bees use bright yellows to show that they are dangerous. Monarch butterflies use their bright orange to tell potential predators that they are poisonous. Coral snakes, poison dart frogs, even skunks with their white stripes are all great examples of aposematism. So yeah, bright colors can indicate danger and predators avoid them as a result. It's so successful that non-dangerous animals have figured out how to use this to their own advantage. They have evolved patterns and colors similar to their deadly counterparts. Coral snakes and milk snakes, copperheads and corn snakes, bull snakes or hognose snakes and rattlesnakes, monarch and viceroy butterflies, and so on. So bright colors are not a reliable indicator of a venomous snake. But there is something that you can do to make sure that you are safe if you live in areas or just happen to be in areas where venomous snakes live. And that is to leave the snakes alone unless you are 1000% sure of what it is. Okay, last venom related myth. Snakes can sting with their tongue. This one is one I just recently came across and it is just weird. The myth is that the forks of a snake's tongue are two stingers that they use to inject venom. What? Here, let me demonstrate the falsity of this. Oh no, I'm dying. A snake's tongue is always going and will certainly be flicking at you when you are holding it. Some snakes even use their tongue as a threat display. But us snake folk know that they are just flicking their tongue to smell. Each tip collects scent particles which they deposit into the Jacobson organ on the roof of their mouth. But there are no shingles on this roof, it's all mouth meat. Yeah, mouth meat. Do you think I should take that joke out? Sounds gross. Yes, it does sound gross. Their sense of smell is so delicate that they can detect changes in concentration of scent on one tip of their tongue versus the other one. They use this to determine the direction of the thing that they are smelling by the difference in concentration between the two tips. Need it? Their tongue is an incredible part of their sensory system, and that's all there is to it. There's no ability to sting. I mean, the tips are fleshy, flesh, flesh. They're just they're soft, squishy, kind of compressed when they hit stuff. It's how are they supposed to break the skin? If you are enjoying this video so far, please consider giving the little thumbs up button down there a little click. It's super easy and it lets YouTube know that you really liked this video and it allows it to be shown to more fine folks just like you who might also find this interesting. Thank you. Next up, snakes are slimy. is an as of yet undocumented species of snake from the southern US, although there are similar myths from other parts of the world too. This circular serpent has an unusual method of locomotion. Instead of using the five methods of snake locomotion, well six if you include gliding, that every other snake in the world uses, these hula hoop wannabes plop their tail in their mouth, forming a wheel, which they somehow orient perpendicular to the ground so that they can roll away when threatened, or more commonly in these myths, roll towards you to attack you at speeds up to 60 miles per hour. Wild, huh? Now, there has never actually been any properly documented cases of this behavior, but there's always someone whose grandpappy told them about hoop snakes, and they definitely saw those hoop snakes, mm-hmm. And so the myth persists. In fact, when I lived in South Bend, just before moving to Virginia, 
A co-worker of my dad's who grew up in the VA warned him, in all seriousness, to watch out for the Black Racers because, and I'm not making this up, they roll up like a wheel and will chase you. And when they catch you, they will stab you with their venomous tail. Well, actually, I think she said poisonous tail, but we all know that's not scientifically accurate. So, none of this is scientifically accurate, so. I thought he was joking when he told me about this conversation. But as I researched this ridiculous myth, it turns out that the tail stabbing behavior is actually part of the folklore. At the very last second, the hoop snake will straighten out and launch at their victim tail first like a spear. The myth also states that the only way to avoid dying from the poison sting of the poison tip poison tail of poison is to duck behind a tree so that the tree gets all of the poison and it will immediately wither and die. Hardcore, eh? There are so many reasons why this is impossible. While it is possible for a snake to bite their tail, it happens by accident. To use that as a means of locomotion is just not feasible. Once in loop mode, how do they orient themselves vertically upwards to be able to roll? How do they steer? 60 miles per hour? How do they do it? And what kind of slopes are these snakes living on? The skeletal muscular structure of a snake is not designed to hold a wheel shape with their ventral scales facing out and then their teeth. Their teeth, they point backwards to ensure that what goes in the mouth stays in the mouth and only goes one way, down their throat. So how does the tail come out so quickly when they decide to try life as a javelin? Why would you put your poison tail in your mouth? So much about this is biologically and physically impossible. And this is just all completely false. Let's stick with the old timey North American myths. These are fun, right? Snakes won't crawl over a rope. This one is a helpful tip used by cowboys when camping under the stars. Howdy. Laying out a rope around the entire camp will protect you from snakes entering your camp to crawl into your sleeping bag for warmth while you sleep. You see, snakes are apparently incapable of slithering over a rope. In some versions, the type of rope is important. It must be a braided rope, or it must be made of horse hair, or it needs to be a certain thickness. But the gist is the same. By some biological quirk, snakes will not cross a rope. Snakes will crawl over vines, which are different than ropes. They can cross logs and water and rocks and sticks. You name it, I've seen it. So why not ropes? Let's see. are called corn snakes and milk snakes are called milk snakes. Hmm. Put any other ideas you have in the comments below. Thank you for watching and until next time remember to nurture all nature. Bye! Can we teach you how to wave so your hand is not back like this? Can you wave like this? Because well, you're weird. like, bye! Yes. Yeah, Why are you holding up all that? <laughs> spirit. Raise the roof. I'm raising their knowledge. Oh my god. <laughs> I quit. Okay. One more time. <laughs> the tongue went up my nose. Did it sting she you? smelled where I smell. <laughs> oh God. This one is a helpful tip to cowboys used. Are you gonna get it okay? Well, well, we'll see. Don't go through my belt loops, please. Oh boy, is he in shot? Yeah, his butt is. Yeah, I think he's good. Alright, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at Oscar. Look at him. What is he? Oscar, what are you he doing? He was doing yoga. <laughs> that was the best yoga pose I've ever yeah. seen. Mm -hmm. Alright, and done. <laughs> Bye.
Good boy. Oh, he's like, I want to be a friend. Hi. 